Sylvie, both you and, and, and Thomas know very little, you know, don't need much of an introduction for myself. Um, Sylvie's had a very distinguished career in public service and politics and has been the Deputy Governor of the Bank de France since January 2018. Um, uh, uh, Thomas Curran has been Chief Executive Officer at Google Cloud since 2019 and Thomas uh, also joined us this time last year for a fireside chat. So Sylvie, um, perhaps I can start with you um, with, with, a, with, a, with a question. Um, there was a paper that you authored last year entitled Europe, Power and Finance. And you said that, if I quote, not only is finance indispensable uh, for innovation, but innovation transforms finance. How do you look at this nexus between finance and innovation today um, but particularly as, as, you know, unfortunately, we enter our third year of dealing with COVID. Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for inviting me. And I hope that uh, we will have a, a debate uh, very soon <laughs> and that uh, Thomas will, will join us. But I'm, I'm glad to answer your question. To be honest, as, as a person uh, working in a, in a central bank, um, this time is really fascinating. Because usually the people in charge of uh, currencies and central banks were about stability and preserve the value of money, preserve the goals. Everything was meant to be the conservation of something, which is, which is fine and which is very important for the stability of the society, the trust in exchanges. But now we have to continue to deliver these goods for the public at large. And at the same time, integrate uh, flabbergasting changes in technology on the one hand, and because of climate change and uh, the impact uh, on nature on the other hand. So we observe changes in the way people are paying. For example, the pandemics showed that um, the, the, the contactless payments increased uh, by 50% in France in 2020, for example. Uh, it is the preferred way to pay uh, at point of sale and, and on, online. We observe uh, several other innovations. I don't need to mention the, the cryptocurrencies or the crypto assets, as we prefer to say in central banks, but also a kind of platformization of exchanges, new actors uh, providing non-bank intermediation with the fintechs, on the one side and the big techs on the other. Um, of course, but Thomas will say more than I can do on, on that. The, the, the cloud outsourcing for that data storage and data processing, uh, the digital platforms bundling different products and services, the use of wider range of initiative on non-financial data, and, and we are just at the beginning of Internet of Things, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I don't want to be too long. I think that the most important thing is to to consider that our role now is, as, as, as a public authority is to make sure that we don't uh, block innovation, which is important, that uh, the public at large uh, can benefit from uh, friendly um, modes of, for example, uh, paying of our payments and, 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 and also costs uh, reduction, and that uh, the, 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 the newcomers find their place, but at the same time that we keep um, all the uh, guarantees we tried to provide or, or we have been trying to provide to the market, such as the uh, financial stability, the good implementation of our monetary policies, because they are quite uh, important. And uh, also the fact that um, simply we finance uh, you know, the, the, the new uh, needs of, of the economy, that these, this function, which is the main purpose of finance, which is to bring savings to projects, can continue without any uh, anti uh, money laundering or, or criminal abuses. So it is quite challenging, uh, but it is also nice because it is a way for us to look at our traditional businesses uh, in a new form. So in other, in other words, you, you, it, it's about um, uh, bringing those benefits, but being very conscious of the risks and maybe the new risks that this new world um, potentially brings and, and how to mitigate those. 
Yeah, it's about mitigation. I, I don't want yeah. that we stay on risks. Uh, if you look at the, the pieces proposed by the European Commission, for example, on crypto asset regulation, the so-called MICA uh, uh, rules, uh, the, 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 the DORA uh, points on, on digital operational resilience mm -hmm. to fight against uh, cyber attacks or the pilot regime on DLT technologies applied to market infrastructures, we try to develop the shields in order, once again, not to make business possible, which is which is really what we want, but to safeguard the environment, a safe environment. Thank you, to, to Thomas. Welcome. <laughs> um, <laughs> that the um, um, so Sylvia and I have, have just started to have a conversation, but but perhaps um, I could ask you um, around the products and services that the Google Cloud provide for, for the financial services industry. In some sense, you, know, you, you and your um, staff have seen firsthand how cloud technologies can spur innovation within financial services. In what ways do you see this happening? We see this happening in three or four important ways. First of all, um, financial services institutions are using new technologies like machine learning, collaboration tools, uh, analytics and data to understand their customers better and to provide a digital interface between the financial institution and their customers. So that's number one. Number two, many are using technology today to streamline processes within the financial institution, whether that is processing documents associated with loans, processing how quickly mortgages can be serviced, etc. And all of this is designed to make financial institutions lower cost and more efficient. The third area of interest is, you know, in areas like know your customer, anti-money laundering, traditional techniques around fraud detection have, can be significantly enhanced with new tools and technology to be much more accurate in detecting fraud both to reduce the number of false positives and to significantly improve the detection of false negatives, if you will. And then lastly, financial institutions have historically needed to do lots of calculations. Calculations are understanding your financial position, mm -hmm. simulating financial market changes, submitting regulatory reporting requirements, and other obligations to regulators. And the tools and technology now allows them to do that much more efficiently, much more in real time, and allows them to submit a more real time view of the financial institution to the regulators. These tools make it faster, easier, lower cost to do these things. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sylvia, may, if I may just come back to you, um, the Bank of France in its latest assessment of risks of the um, financial sector, um, it observed that there was increased digitalization within the sector, which we've spoken about, um, but that's also increased the vulnerability to, to cyber risks uh, in, in particular. <clears throat> what measures, um, or what are the measures that the sector has to consider when mitigating these threats? Well, th thanks for underlying this aspect, because of course it's quite mechanical when you use more digital tools, you expose yourself to, to more uh, cyber threats, above all in a very special uh, geopolitical context, I don't want to comment, but which is a reality. And we all know that finance is one of the main targets of uh, criminals using uh, cyber methods. Uh, maybe because they know that in this sector you have people who could have the means to, to pay for, for ransom or whatever. So uh, we see two answers. One is, is to, um, to improve the resilience uh, to an operational shock uh, with uh, cyber risk prevention and also uh, rules. Uh, for example, market infrastructures rely on proven cybersecurity frameworks set by standard setting bodies called CROE, Cyber Resilience Oversight Expectations for Financial Markets Infrastructure in the European Union. And this is one of the priorities of the current French uh, presidency of the EU 
Um, there is a project discussed right now called DORA to uh, Digital Operational Resilience Act. It is quite important as we have a banking union, we have a single currency, a single market for financial services that we uh, put in place um, the resilience instruments at, at the right level and we help uh, the different national authorities to better cooperate. So there is an aspect of rules. And then of course, the rules enough um, are not enough uh, as such. Um, you need to set up the bodies to facilitate the exchange of information and coordinate if there is an attack operational responses between financial players. So in France, uh, banks and market infrastructures exchange within the organized and secure framework of the Paris Resilience Group coordinated by the Banque de France. Uh, at the European level, uh, there is a Euro, Euro Cyber Resilience Board for pan-European financial infrastructures, uh, which allows public and private uh, actors to share strategic, operational, and tactical cyber information within a trusted community. Of course, it's always difficult to make sure that people exchange information. It has to be uh, in a very safe uh, environment where you don't uh, fear uh, leaks or uh, use or abuse of some information. And then one thing we um, try to promote is really to, to have crisis simulations. Uh, under the French presidency of the G7 in 2019, we had a, a major uh, cyber exercise with participants from all uh, G7 countries, some of them only public authorities, some other including private sector, it was the case for France. And since then we have continuously worked to improve our capacity. It is sometimes very basic when you are attacked, what is the main thing to do? Is, is it to be very quick in resetting the system or is it more important to be sure that when you reset um, the problem is really settled? What less, which lessons do we draw? Uh, who are the contact points, etc. Exactly as we do it for fire uh, exercise in the buildings, for example, to make sure that people get used to uh, this situation and better prepared. Even if we are very humble, it's a race between the ones uh, trying to attack us and, and, and ourselves, but we try to improve the, the level of, uh, of response. So Thomas, I'll, I'll come back to, <clears throat> to ask you on um, DORA, the EU Digital Operational Resilience Act in a moment, but I, just to come back on cyber, um, and I wonder um, whether you've experienced the same trends in cyber risk that, that Sylvie just outlined, and whether you think actually the growing adoption of cloud for financial services firms actually helps in terms of its mitigation. You know, we, we are working on three or four important elements to help financial institutions and other clients have much better resilience and protection from cyber risk. The four key elements, number one, technology has evolved significantly over the last several years. And the first thing that many institutions can do a better job is having a more secure by default position. See, historically, te some technology was hard to implement, for example, encryption. It was very hard and expensive to implement. It therefore was not widely used, which meant when somebody was able to enter the financial institution or any other institution, they were able to get access to data much more easily. So as technology has advanced, uh, there is an option now to enforce security much more easily by design. That's number one. Number two is to improve financial institutions posture associated with risks. You know, there's a technology and an approach that we have worked on for many years, almost 14 years now, which is now becoming quite popular, this notion of zero trust. And zero trust is you run your environment assuming that you trust nobody. And so as a result, if somebody were able to you know, bypass your security controls, first of all, you would have much more resilient security position. And secondly, even if they were trying to bypass it, it would be much harder because you didn't trust them and therefore you did not give them access to very much. The third one is 
we're also investing heavily in technology for organizations to audit themselves and their security configuration to detect if they're resilient. You know, one of the things we see often with cyber attacks is every cyber incident is like a black swan event, which is before the cyber incident occurred, the organization thought it was protected and secure. After the incident, they realized they were not. And so part of it is helping them understand their overall security posture and what kinds of risks are they exposed to so they can act on it with them. Lastly, philosophically, we feel that as a technology provider to financial institutions, it's our job to have this notion of shared fate. You know, we have a joint responsibility with them to ensure that their end customers and their consumers and their institutional clients and their data are kept secure. And so there's many things we're doing operationally to ensure that we are fulfilling this promise of shared fate that we commit to, to our customers. So these are all things that we feel cyber risk is yet another kind of risk that financial institutions need to now manage. And whenever you have a new kind of risk, the first thing we always say is you should be able to reduce it. You should be able to measure it. You should be able to manage it just like any other risk that an organization faces. Thank you. I, I, I agree with that. Um, if I can now just come back, Thomas, to you on, on the um, on Dora, um, and you know what what we're seeing, you know, particularly in Europe, but it's not only Europe; it applies elsewhere. Is as cloud adoption increases, um, you're getting the increase in regulation around outsourcing cyber operational resilience. So, so, so Dora is one example, but there are others. And in your view, how is the this, this trend to regulation um, uh, impacting the industry and particularly on the, the ability to innovate going forward? So, you know, regulation is something that we work with all the time. We work with our financial services clients and regulators in many countries to ensure not just our technology is meeting the needs of the regulators, but our processes and practices are also governed by the regulators in the right way, and that we are able to help financial institutions meet the regulatory obligations. Now, in general, when we look at regulation, it's important for us that we look at it very context specifically. And there are a few general principles that we feel are important when we look at new regulatory initiatives. The first one is the notion of proportionality or materiality. And so we feel it's important that regulatory measures are proportional and targeted at addressing material risks that institutions, financial institutions have. Secondly, technology neutrality. You know, we, we perfectly understand the value that a regulation may provide, but it's important to us that the regulation does not preclude the use of a technology rather than require the technology to meet a standard. For example, cloud, for instance, unlike traditional outsourcing, gives financial institutions more cost efficiency, but it implements certain things differently than a traditional outsourcing environment. Uh, for instance, this notion of multi-tenancy. The third is harmonization. In many jurisdictions, and we have many clients that we serve in Europe and overseas, that work in multiple parts and in multiple countries around the world. And so as a technology provider trying to help these institutions operate their business in many parts of the world, we feel it's important that the regulatory landscape today has many existing and emerging regimes, often applying the same set of issues and circumstances, but differently. So we support efforts to streamline and harmonize regulation wherever possible. Uh, and then lastly, obviously, this notion of due process. One of the most important aspects to us as new regulatory regimes are developed is due process to help shape how the regulatory regime works and how it's applied. But so we see all of these as important elements to help regulators and financial institutions further how 
technology can be applied in financial institutions and improve financial systems around the world. Yeah. Sylvie, if I could come back to you. Um, I mean, the risks are different with technology. Technology is phenomenally important now for the for the financial services sector, as, as you discussed previously. So where do you see EU regulation of technology going from here? In, in particular, and, and you mentioned the, the French presidency uh, earlier on, but the, the, the efforts around digital sovereignty, where do you see this taking us in Europe in this regard? Well, uh, first of all, I would like to, 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 to answer to Thomas. I, of course, proportionality is always something difficult because uh, it's a question of where do you put the threshold, et cetera, et cetera. But it is clear that we are between, the, we, we want two th things that are a little bit contradictory. One, as you said, Thomas, is harmonization. We would like to have rules uh, giving a level playing field where we can all uh, know uh, in cross-border exchanges what the rules are, et cetera, et cetera. This is fine. We have, by the way, the same desire for climate. The truth is that at this stage, we don't have any global government or global body uh, in the position to adopt rules. So we do our best, for example, in the G20, um, at the BIS in Basel, in several committees of the FSB, to uh, make sure that we can at least converge, even if it is harmonized. But the dream of something completely harmonized would require another political organization of the world, and we don't have it, or we don't have it yet. And at the same time, there are very strong, um, there is a strong desire to defend a, a kind of sovereignty to, to keep control uh, or to take back control, as the Brexiters used to say, and to make sure that you uh, can reflect in the rules the expectations of your own society. For example, in democracy can be very different on privacy than in countries where there is more control of the population, et cetera. So we are between these two different desires, uh, legitimate, uh, but uh, not uh, very easy uh, to combine. So this is the, the, the first thing I wanted to say uh, in answer to, to Thomas. And of course, um, the process of adopting rules is exactly the place where we can listen to the private sector and integrate their uh, concerns, also take into account the concerns of, of the clients, of, of uh, the, 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 the households and, and companies. Of course, for us as a central bank, we, we don't create the rules. We are not legislators or regulators. We implement them and we supervise. For us, I would say that uh, it is very important to be sure that we can preserve financial stability. We did a lot of work since the great financial crisis to, to put in place a framework. This was made at, at the global level with some differences, but it was a common effort. So we want to keep this stability framework. We, we want to be able to fulfill our mandates on monetary policy and in the current context of uh, increasing inflation, it is complicated enough. Um, and we want to be sure that, as I said before, uh, that we don't encourage uh, criminal activities so we can uh, stick to our uh, stringent standards on, on uh, anti-money laundering. So this is a little bit the, the rationale behind what we, we try to do. Um, of course, for, for above all for, for the cloud uh, industry, uh, the question of the critical uh, ICT third party providers is, is key, including the cloud service pro providers, and, and they are included in the regulatory perimeter. Uh, in the text, as they stand, um, each, um, uh, each agency of the European Union will look at the sector it is in charge of. Uh, maybe one day we will have something which is more uh, across the board. I have heard what, what Stephen Meyer said, but at this stage, uh, as you mentioned, the French presidency, the text on the table discussed and, and in the democratic framework of the European Union uh, chosen uh, another approach, which is a sectoral one. 
And uh, we will also have a um, uh, EU open finance framework coming soon uh, to support data-driven innovation, encourage the creation of innovative products for, for consumers and businesses. We know that very soon the directive on, on payment system uh, will be reviewed to, uh, to preserve a level playing field for all activities in the changing environment where, where banks, think tanks, and big techs are more and more working together. And that's the reason why, for example, proportionality is, is a concept which is sometimes difficult to apply when you have um, actors having a certain amount of clients and big tech entering the sector with the uh, enormous amount of clients they have uh, got in other fields, uh, maybe not all appropriate to make business, but, and, and, and you also have uh, the, the creative think tech. So these new uh, businesses, also the new types of asset and infrastructures with the blockchain and the decentralized finance bring promises, but also a lot of vulnerabilities. And this is what the legislation try to encapsulate uh, the MICA uh, regulation will in particular regulate the use of uh, stable coins for payment purposes. It is creating a very stimulating environment uh, for innovative businesses. But once again, we want this to happen uh, while preserving financial stability. Thank you. With the, the time we got left, there's just one, one policy topic that I want to um, just pick up on, and, and Sylvie, you've mentioned this around um, uh, sustainable finance previously, but, but Thomas, maybe I can ask you that question first. In, in that, how does cloud help in terms of the, the fight against um, climate change, and how does this support companies with sustainability, sustainability initiatives? <clears throat> we work with companies using our technology for sustainability in three important ways. First, you know, we have been carbon neutral for 14 years. Our data centers have been carbon neutral for 14 years. It allows companies to migrate workloads to the cloud and reduce their own carbon footprint uh, significantly. We also have committed publicly that we will be carbon free over the next 10 years as Alphabet. And so we are very committed to that path. Number two, we provide solutions to allow institutions to measure the, the specific impact their businesses have on the environment. So for instance, we're helping manufacturing companies, consumer packaged goods companies, logistics companies and others to measure the impact they're in the manufacturing process in the distribution process, in the sourcing process that they have on the environment that then allows them to in turn reduce the impact that they're having on the environment. The third is we're also working with financial institutions who are looking to make, you know, to measure organizations based on, for example, their commitments to ESG goals or to, uh, you know, sustainability objectives so that if the if financial institutions want to measure the quality of the commitments they're making and the progress they're making, they can use the tools on that. And then lastly, Google has a technology that's called Earth Engine, that's part of our cloud. It allows financial institutions and others to simulate climate change and then to measure the impact of climate change on specific things. For example, if you're investing in real estate, the impact on real estate portfolios around the world. So our, our approach is to help reduce the impact that organizations have on the environment, to provide the tools to help them measure different elements of progress towards sustainability. Thank you. So, so, Sophie, la la last question for you. Um, I mean, really, the Bank de France has been at the forefront of the, the public authorities in terms of um, identifying um, uh, you know, climate uh, change risks. You, you've, heard, you've heard what Thomas has said. You know, we, we know what the EU is doing at the legislative um, side. In what other ways can the financial services sector move the needle in this regard? 
Well, it's uh, it's uh, yes, it's one of our priorities, and I'm glad that you that you mentioned this in this um, tour d'horizon of of the risks. So we 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 try to do our part. Uh, what I would like to stress is that in any case, it is not just an issue for central banks. It's an issue for public authorities. They can uh, take regulations, adopt regulations. They can. Uh, provide incentives or create sanctions, uh, give a price to carbon, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't pretend that central banks are the only public authorities in charge by far. Uh, second thing, it is also something we have in common with many private actors. And um, Thomas mentioned what they are doing, but uh, you know, all the initiatives came, taken in the framework of the COP26 in Glasgow, all the commitments made by, by finance industry, and finance is quite advanced uh, if you compare with some other sectors. But by far, we have not uh, a climate consistent capital allocation yet, and we have a lot of work to do. So what do we do? We try to, we, to be skin in the game, we have decided the Banque de France to green our non-monetary portfolios, so pension funds and reserves, it was a way to walk the talk, uh, to make sure that we are doing ourselves what we could ask the others to do, and we learn a lot. Uh, you can find on the website of the Banque de France since 2018 our um, uh, investment strategy, uh, ESG-oriented climate and even ESG. So this is one field. The second field we contributed last year to the greening of the monetary policy of the, the euro system. It's a decision taken by the ECB under the leadership of Christine Lagarde. We are also, we organized last year the first pilot stress testing of the French banking and insurance sector to look at uh, their portfolio using the, the scenarios of the, the network we contributed to create an NGFS, the network for greening the financial system. Uh, which includes now more than 100 central banks and, and financial authorities worldwide on the five continents. And these scenarios are once again not perfect, but it is a first step in the direction of having stress tests. And the, the, the European uh, supervisory arm of the ECB, the SSM, is going to organize uh, climate stress testing this year. And of course, we look at uh, the way we... Um, we uh, work as, as a kind of rating agency, I put it in a prudent way, but uh, for our own companies in France, we give a, a kind of rating which is used to uh, by banks to give credits and by the central bank to uh, use some, um, uh, some instrument as collateral. So we try to work on all the fields which are under our responsibility. Uh, and we know that it is very complex. Uh, for example, if you look at the fact that now more and more scientists uh, insist on the nexus between climate and biodiversity, nature related issues, or the social uh, diversity uh, demands coming from the society are very strong. There is a lot of work done on disclosure by the TNFD, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosure after the TCFD. So we are very busy. And we try to contribute, but uh, we are fully aware that this is a collective commitment and uh, there is still a lot to do if we want to go to, to net zero in uh, 2050. Thank you very much. Adam Sylvie Goulard, Thomas Curran, thank you both very much for your time, uh, for a stimulating conversation and for sharing all your insights today on these key issues. So, so thank you both very much.